All right, welcome back. We've set the table now for finding the area, the specific area under a curve. We have the left endpoint approximations and the right endpoint approximations. By the way, these weren't the only two types of approximations that we could have used. There's midpoint approximations, which takes the midpoint of intervals, and there's also like trapezoidal approximations. The important thing is actually simply this. We used left endpoint and right endpoint so that we had a very specific point on these intervals to tackle. But you'll notice as we increase the number in intervals in both of these cases, and we get more and more and more intervals, this approximation becomes nearly perfect. And more importantly, is that as you see, and we have a massive number of intervals, it actually doesn't matter much if we choose the left endpoint or the right endpoint. And that's a really important point. What we're going to define right now is called the Riemann sum. And the Riemann sum is going to use this same technique, but it's gonna have the flexibility to say, for every ith interval, choose any point on that interval. Because we're gonna end up choosing enough intervals that it doesn't actually matter which point, the end point, the midpoint, or, or the beginning of the interval that we choose for the point representing that interval. So here we have the setup for a Riemann sum, and this is really no different than what was previously discussed. We're talking about a function defined on an interval we're calling a, b. We have this regular partition, which means we have these intervals of equal lengths. We'll define those lengths or the widths of those intervals as delta x. Each ith interval is this x i sub 1 comma x i. Right? And then we're going to let xi in this case, and this is the significant difference between the last two approximations. We have xi star, and this is going to be any point on the ith interval. And this will be important for future proofs of what we're going to try to do with finding the area, is that if we have a function that has, let's say it's continuous nearly everywhere, but it has a few discrete discontinuous points, we will be able to jump around this discontinuities to still find areas. And I don't want to get in the weeds on that, but this is a very important statement about being any point on the ith interval. Then, given this setup, we have this definition for what we call the Riemann sum. And so therefore, the Riemann sum by the way, found by, this was discovered or developed by Bernard Riemann. He, anybody who discovered these, obviously, as you know in mathematics at this point, gets things named after them, right? So the Riemann sum is defined as what you'd expect and we've seen before. The sum of the function values of these xi points, again, any points on this ith interval, multiplied by the width of these intervals, this delta x, and this will go from i equals 1 to n, directly set up as our left and right points, the big difference here being this part right here. All right, there we have it. The complete foundation we need to define the area under the curve given the operators that we now know. Again, this Riemann sum is a slight tweak. It's all it's saying is that instead of a left or right endpoint, we're going to generally take any point within the ith interval. Again, this hinting at, so give us some flexibility in the future to skip over any random discontinuities that we have, but we don't need to deal with that right now. But we can now define rigorously the area under a curve. So given a continuous function and a non-negative function, this will be important and we'll talk a bit more about this in the next section. Given a non-negative function on the, an interval a, b, the area under the curve can be defined by the area is this Riemann sum right here. With the added component that the number of subintervals that we're going to take on this interval a, b will go to infinity. And so here now, we're introducing the calculus part where we're going to have the number of these intervals go to infinity. So now you see it, what this is, the area under the curve will be us working with these sigma sums in these functions where we have function values being multiplied by these small delta x. As n goes to infinity, it's also really important to understand that this value, this delta, the size of each interval 
will go to zero. So as the number of intervals go to infinity, this will go to zero. We'll look more at that in the next section. And obviously the work of evaluating these will now be a combination of evaluating these sigma sums, but then also applying our understanding of limits that we've seen previously. All right, and we end this section with this conversation of looking to apply the concepts that we're working with. I mean, while it might be fun just to find the areas under these curves, we want a real reason, an application for using this mathematical technique. And this is a bit of a hint of what we're doing. In this case right here, what we're given is a motorcycle was driving down a road for a minute. We've calculated the details for a minute. And what we get are every 12 seconds, we're getting a snapshot of the speed. And the game is using that information, we can provide a fairly accurate estimate for the distance traveled by this motorcycle. So specifically in this context, we're given speedometer readings every 12 seconds we get from this motorcycle. We've converted these from miles per hour into feet per second, just so it's easier to do the, the math with seconds. And so what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the distance traveled by first using the velocities from the beginning of the intervals. So for instance, in this first interval from zero to 12 seconds, this bike was going 30, 30 feet per second at zero seconds. We're going to use that representation of, of 30 feet per second for the whole first interval, and then going down for all the intervals in exactly the same way. Then what we're going to do is take the velocities from the ends of the intervals. And hopefully that you can see the connection to this between the approximations we use for the left and the right. The left approximation was taking the values from the beginning of the interval. The, the right hand approximation, endpoint approximation, is using the information from the end of the interval. So this is a direct application of that approximation technique. So what I'm going to do for the first part is I'm going to assume that this motorcycle is going 30 feet per second for the whole first 12 seconds here. And so what I'm going to do is use that velocity and multiply it by the length of time. So I have for the first interval, I have this motorcycle is going 30 feet per second and it goes for that long for 12 seconds. And then what I'm going to do is do the same thing for every each of the intervals. For the next interval, I'm going to take the 28 feet per second and multiply it by the length of that interval. Again, this is that delta x, right? The length of the interval by 12 seconds. So this will stay constant through each of these terms. I'm going to, in this case, just use the velocity from the beginning of the interval. Let me write this out and see if we can clarify what's going on. So what I have here in each of these terms is the velocity being multiplied by the amount of time, right? This is the formula, distance equals rate times time. The rate for how long? Each of these intervals is 12 seconds. We have five intervals. If you look up there, we have six pieces of information we've been given, but they cover just five different 12 second intervals to cover that 60 seconds. So here we have the individual distances traveled for each interval, again, using the beginning of the intervals. Before I calculate that, I'm now going to show you the exact same sum, but using the velocities from the end of the intervals. So then here I've written out the terms for using the velocities from the ends of the intervals. And now just to clarify, I've written down in the very bottom. In these first terms, I'm calculating the distance traveled by this motorcycle for zero to 12 seconds. So the distance between these two readings right here. In the first case, I'm using the velocity from the beginning of that time interval. Here I'm using the velocity from the end of the interval. In each of these cases, I'm adding all of the distances traveled in these intervals in order to compute the overall distance or an estimate for the overall distance traveled. And when I did that, this one gives me 1,548 feet traveled by this motorcycle. Again, this would be in feet because it's in feet per second times seconds. The seconds cancel, giving me units of feet. And in this case, I get 1,512 feet or 1,512 feet for that estimate using the ends of the intervals. And as spoken with the left endpoint and right endpoint approximations, which is exactly what this is, but now in a context, 
we have a range of values for we can safely assume that this motorcycle, as long as it didn't, didn't accelerate and decelerate too crazily in between these readings, we have a very good range for the distance traveled by this motorcycle. This isn't just for distance, though this distance problem is a classic example used at this point to introduce the contextual use of integration. Though in this case, or in any case, you can use this if you're given the information and you're given a rate of change. And this is different, right? For, for differentiation, we will be trying to find velocity or rates of change. In this case, we would given information and then observable data that includes rates of change. And then we can use that to find the overall quantities, in this case, feet traveled.